It was about going from a tool watch into a wearable, beautiful, aesthetic, tasteful watch. This was his idea with the, um, with the premier line. In 2017, George Kern and a private equity firm called CVC bought 80% of Breitling for a billion dollar valuation. As of December 7th in 2022, the value of Breitling was $4.5 billion. George Kern is to me one of the great capitalist success stories of the watch industry. Today he's launching his new Premier B01 and I'm super excited to check it out. Come with me. What's going on guys, Waco from Revolution here with an absolute legend in the watch industry, Mr. George Kern, how are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you very much for being here. It's such a pleasure. You know, one of the first things I wanna talk about is the success story of Breitling since you took it over in 2017, right? Um, I believe in 20, uh, 2021, you already had a revenue figure of $700 million. I believe uh, last year you did between eight and 900 million. And I believe you're on trajectory to even surpass one billion, right? And if you, you know, since you took the brand over in 2017, where the revenue figures were in the 300s, how did you triple this and create such relevance for Breitling in such a short period of time? Um, I didn't realize the inner strength of Breitling even when I joined the company, to oh, be wow. totally honest. Right. And I discovered it with time. Uh, I've said that several times. Brightling has one of the richest back catalogs in the whole industry. We have phenomenal products, by the way, one of which we're uh, renouncing now. That's um, number one. The second beauty of, of Brightling is that we are generalist brands. So we offer everything from professional electronic watches to more classic watches like the Premier here. So if you want, we have SUVs, SUVs we have convertibles, we have um, uh, limousines, we have everything. Right. The third, I think, huge advantage is that we are in a very sweet price point. Our average price today is around 6,300 Swiss francs. It's a price point um, which is not cheap, obviously, but which is affordable for many people around the world. Uh, uh, the last thing is, I think we, we touched a vibe in the society with our surfing, with our triathlon, with our partnerships with Triumph, these uh, modern retro style we have in, in the watches, which you have in the boutiques, but also with our partnerships, also for instance with Triumph motorbikes. The whole package works very well, but we've inherited something great from the Brightling founders um, since this company exists. That's amazing. Um, I, I kind of think of you as kind of an ethical capitalist. And what I think you've done since 2017 is rather extraordinary. So if we can just kind of go backtrack a little bit. 2017, you and CBC come in and you purchase 80% uh, of, of Breitling for 800 million, if I'm not mistaken. And in 2018, the remaining 20% is purchased. But then in 2021, you have Partners Group come in at a valuation of 3.3 billion, purchasing 25%. And then as of de December 7th last year, at a 4.5 billion uh, valuation. I mean, that's incredible. The amount of value that you've created for shareholders, the amount of value you've created for this brand is incredible. What has been you know, the, the, the core pillars for achieving this? First of all, um, we are also investors. Um, when CVC came in, the management had 10% of the company. Uh, we have hundreds of people who are investors in this company. Our interests are aligned. I don't need to motivate uh, you know, my, my people. Uh, and we're not talking about stock options. It's money which is going from our account to another account. It's very different than getting in a public company you know, stock options. It's right. going from your account to somebody else's account and the money is gone. So our interests are extremely aligned. Uh, with this, I could build an incredibly strong management team. Everybody has a phenomenal, and I saw it during COVID, an incredible sense of responsibility. Uh, there's a dynamic vibe. You know, we are successful when you make one goal, you want to make 
uh, score a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, you're in a, in a positive vibe. We have a fantastic design team. We have great mar marketing, great operations. But the fact that we are, in a way, all entrepreneurs, that we are all aligned with CVC and partners groups, I think helps uh, a lot the whole process. Besides everything I told you before, the, the incredible positive heritage we had from uh, the, 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 the Breitling and the Schneider family. Amazing. Um, okay, I, I know you don't publish these figures, but I'm going to just estimate here. But if I'm thinking you're close to a billion dollars in terms of turnover, and you're probably at a 25% EBITDA around there, you're making a profit of $250 million a year. I mean, how did you achieve such a profitable company while still making such amazing products? Well, also, when you're in private equity, you know, we don't have uh, uh, private jets. Right. You, you know, we... we <laughs> Um, we, we don't have drivers, we don't have Mercedes S-classes and stuff. Um, we take the train. Um, I have top management taking even second-class second trains. So we save a lot of money and invest you know, in products, in design, in, in the company. So we have a totally different cost structure than obviously big groups with big operations. As I said, <clears throat> we, we, we are totally aligned with, with CVC. We want to create value uh, for our shareholders, but also for um, you know, all the other stakeholders. We are a big taxpayer in, uh, in Zoloturn, in the canton of Zoloturn. We've created hundreds of new employments. So, uh, and this is our role. You know, we, we have a very strong ESG policy and I always say we need to do as entrepreneurs the maximum we can in our sphere of influence uh, and, and to help all the stakeholders. I think we have been elected the fourth uh, best employer in Switzerland out of 250. Oh. Um, just Rolex, by the way, is a third best <laughs> employer, but we're just behind Rolex, Amazing. which is, which is um, a lot of fun. So people love to work for Breitling. Uh, we pay well, we, we are a good taxpayer, we have a good ESG policy, we still have lots of things to do, right? We, you're never white, you're never black, but we always have to go forward and to do the best we can as quickly as we can in our sphere of influence. Let's, you know, what I see is a reactivity that I find amazing. You know, um, I, when you want to be involved in something, instantly you're there, and you're usually with the top people in that, or the top brands in that, in terms of the collaborations you do. <coughs> um, when you m are making watches, there's also a sensitivity to what consumers actually want, what the customer actually wants to wear on his wrist. Um, I think you were the one of the first to really understand the neo vintage trend and really capitalize on that. Talk to me about leadership in an independent company as opposed to leadership in a big group where sometimes you feel everything is committee driven and it's a big ship that's hard to steer. You always had, have advantages and disadvantages and I've been on both sides, um, um, if you want, of, of, of the border. You know, when you're in a big group, you have the power you have. You have um, uh, you know, also the power towards the retailers, etc. And, and you have lots of advantages um, uh, because you always have one brand helping another or uh, in, in, especially, you know, in the context of COVID, for instance, uh, the first thing you look or what we were looking uh, on was cash flow. You know, you can be profitable, but you can still go bankrupt uh, if you don't have for a certain period of time Cash is like what is exactly what happened to Credit Suisse. Right. It, you know, it's suddenly capital is, is taken out, and 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 you have a, you have basically a cash flow problem. So, but on the other side, um, you're much quicker. It's exactly what you said. The reactivity is there, and we saw it during COVID. We continue. We we had a total different strategy. We continued to be dynamic. We were incredibly present on social media. We launched the Konomat, which has been a very good, uh, incredible success. So um, indeed, the decision process is very short. It's one phone call. If I have a big financial decision to take, it's one phone call with, with Partners Group or with CVC. And um, these people are investment bankers. They're not consultants. And investment bankers are much quicker than consultants in, 
in, in, um, in taking the decisions. Obviously today, after five years, everybody, they trust us, we, we know each other, and, but speed is of essence. But I think the other thing was, uh, or where the values, the post-COVID values, we have a war in the Ukraine, it's two hours or three hours by plane from here. It might be different in Asia or in the US where there's less of an immediate reaction. And I think it changed the attitude of consumers. You know, we talk about neo-luxury, uh, casual luxury, look how cool you are looking. We are talking about sustainable luxury and we are talking about um, inclusive luxury in terms of the sports we support. So um, we, we like the fact that everybody can go for a swim, like in triathlon. Right. We like the idea that everybody can go on a bicycle. We like the idea that everybody can play rugby or what have you. So we want to be accessible. We want to be exclusive. We are exclusive by price, by distribution, but we don't want to be exclusive by arrogance. We want to be inclusive in the way uh, and with the partners we have. So these set of values, I think, change or values changed over the last two or three years, four years with COVID, the Ukraine war, inflation, uh, energy prices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and I think this is why not only because of the design and our nice boutiques and advertising, but people understand what we are doing and why we are doing this. And this, I think, the last five years in terms of mindset of the consumer I think was a, dr uh, was a dramatic change versus you know decades before and I think you were on the forefront of reacting to that so okay I'm going to quote a friend of mine named uh, Wen Xia who's one of the managing partners at Kleiner Perkins the uh, the legendary VC firm in Silicon Valley and he said you know in, in life you can be either a missionary or a mercenary and the irony is that the guys that are coin driven invariably never make that much coin and the guys who are mission driven are are the ones that usually succeed the most commercially and otherwise you seemed okay let's let's first say you've become an inordinately wealthy man as a result of the success you created for Breitling but you seem driven by something else by the mission what is the long term mission for you uh, and what do you want to do by the mission or by success i want to be successful you know um as I said, I always tell my team, okay, even if we score three goals, there's no reason why we should stop. Let's score another three goals. You know, I was in my previous life and with my previous brands, I might have been successful, but it's like in soccer again. You've been successful in one team. It doesn't mean that you will be successful in the next team. So after the game is before the game. And, and you know, five years ago, we were nowhere. nowhere. Nobody was expecting the success we had. And everybody was critical on our strategy. There was, everybody said, you're going to, to you know, drive this company against the wall, blah, blah, blah. And I always said to the team, because we were convinced about our strategy, I said, only success will prove that we were right. There's nothing else than success. Right. You cannot argue success. You can talk about the wings, you can talk about this or that, okay. But at the end of the day, it's a consumer, the end consumer who decides. And if he decides on Brightling, and obviously he does, it means that we did the right thing. Fantastic. Um, there are, of course, so much speculation in terms of what the eventual goal is. Will you go for an IPO with um, Brightling, for example, or potentially even create a mini group um, and, over, and acquire more brands? Can you give us a little bit of a hint as to what your long-term strategy is? I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in that case, I think let's go back to 80 years ago uh, when Willie Breitling took a watch that was pragmatic, the chronograph, you know, and transformed it into something that was beautiful, an expression of elegance, and that was the premiere. How yeah. significant was that for you? I think the premiere, which by the, in French means first, uh, is an absolute key product, or was a key product for Willie Breitling at that time, and it is for us today. For Willy Breitling, it was, and we've, we've discussed that with Gregory Breitling, his son, it was about going from a tool watch into a variable, beautiful, aesthetic, tasteful watch. This was his idea with the, um, with the premier line. And 
it's the, the, the classic of the classic, in a way, might be less known than the Navi timer, but in terms of um, evolution of the brand, it was absolutely a key, key product for, for brightening at that time. Um, and therefore, it is so important that um, we have precious metal that we've launched already, some complicated watches a year ago mm. uh, with the tourbillon or the duograph, datograph, all these classic designs of, of Breitling. Um, and, and I'm so happy that we have it now as the ultimate historical uh, product coming from the, the founder generation. Um, again, it might be less known than the Navi timer, but I think strategically for us, it's an absolute key product. Phenomenal. I think one thing that was really interesting was <coughs> Willie Breitling wanted to express optimism, right? It was during the end of the, the tumultuous moment in Europe and he was looking into the future and he felt that cohesively society wanted to express their optimism. And in some ways the premiere became a symbol of that, right? Now we're in a very similar circumstance. We went through two and a half, three crazy years of a pandemic. We were emerging from that. Sure, there's still some up and downs, especially in the financial market, but in general, there's a wonderful sense of optimism. How much do you think the premiere is an expression of that? It's funny that you say that. A colleague of yours uh, said the other day to me, uh, Brightening is like Happy Days brand, you know? Uh, you remember yes. uh, that, that US... Um, with Wanzi. Uh, with Wanzi, <laughs> exactly, uh, series. Yeah. And uh, yes, of course, we are optimists. Um, and we show this optimism, by the way, also in the colors, in the diversity of colors in our dyes. So we were the ones launching the mint, uh, uh, the mint dyes. We, we, we uh, dramatically pushed uh, the ice blue. Um, we, 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 we go with, with copper. We try to go away from the classic uh, dark blue or black or silver and bring more life into, into the game. And you saw it last year with the Super Ocean, oh, with Kelly Slater, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> with all these turquoise dyes, yeah. etc., which are extremely successful. And I think this reflects also, as you said, the mind of the consumer. Consumers, it's, it's, it's time of carpe diem. You know, people, you don't know what tomorrow will be. And people want to enjoy life here and now, uh, which I understand, which I understand. Uh, so, Let's give them happiness, um, um, coolness, uh, and beauty all together. And I think you will find all of this uh, in Breitling. It's a, they're beautifully um, executed watches, really great on the wrist, super refined. Um, I remember in 2021 when you launched the uh, collection, including the Duograph and also the, the Tora, you also had a 40mm uh, manual wine B09 yeah. uh, premiere. Uh, uh, which was 40 mm in diameter, but I noticed that these watches are all 42. Do you find that 42 is in fact the sweet spot then? Or? We'll, we'll continue with the 40 millimeter, but it's a hand wound. Right. So the movement is smaller and flatter. And um, with this, if you want to have uh, nice proportions with an automatic, this is a B01 automatic chronograph right. with chronometer certifi uh, certificate, five years of guarantee. We saw that um, and talking with Sylvain Bernon, who is our designer, that 42 was the right diameter where you have the best proportions. But we're going to have more hand wound in 40 millimeter, uh, more, uh, a wider offering very soon. We have a beautiful new uh, silver dial, uh, really a new type of silver coming. Obviously we have this uh, mint green, so there will be more stuff in the in the hand wound also by the way with some complications fantastic let me ask you something you know you really are uh, i think of you also as kind of like a um, ethical warrior in, in terms of what you've been trying to do for sustainability throughout this entire industry i think for you the esg um, policies that uh, you have and that you you hope that all watch brands will have are fundamental in terms of uh, being relevant to the next generation and you know or to human society at all why is that so important to you? I couldn't explain you. I, I was like this all my, my whole 
professional career, also in my previous life, I started, you know, uh, with my previous companies to, to, turn to, uh, to turn them into carbon neutral companies. You know, um, as I said, to do the maximum we can, we did a fantastic project many years back with David Rothschild, you know, talking about the plastic garbage patch in the oceans, uh, when he launched his Contiki or Plastiki uh, boat. <laughs> And, um, and I always believed in, um, um, in the need of trying to turn this world into a better place, in particular uh, with, with environment. And we have, we, we cannot, we're too small to change the world. We're not Coca-Cola, but we have very influential customers. Right. And um, we talk to 250,000, 300,000 customers a year buying our watches. These are <clears throat> people with a certain income in certain positions, and they have the leverage. And I think, you know, we changed our packaging. We, we, we did so many things also with ec our Econil straps. We launched, we were basically the first brand launching on an industrial basis. Um, lab-grown diamonds for um, you know that watch which we call Origin yeah. where we also buy uh, gold from what we call artisanal uh, mines uh, where everything is controlled we can do this why wouldn't we do it if we can do it and for instance that product with these lab-grown diamonds and it was a very critical debate it's a huge success especially in very advanced regions like California, US, etc. And I'm sure you will see much more of this. We have the blockchain. I want to give transparency to the con consumer on what he's actually buying, who are our suppliers, and he deserves it. And this is our contribution as a small company in the context of the world to, to try to improve the state of this world. That's fascinating. You know, when I put this watch on my wrist with this stunning copper dial, and I see, of course, you know, the 765 and 777 reflected in this sort of 80-year-old, but like, design, which is still as iconic today, I also love the fact that the underlying ethics of the company that made this watch are ethics that I super respect. You know, and I have to really congratulate you for being a pioneer in this, George. You know, okay. let's talk about, uh, um, okay, we know how extraordinary your growth has been, but even more potential growth. Are there any markets, for example, that you feel that you have are still relatively untapped? Yeah. First of all, I'm a true believer in the luxury industry. I think the luxury industry, when you look at the, we have been talking about finance, if you look at the stock market of all these big groups since the 1980s, woof, it's going up. So you have the steeps when you have I don't know, Lehman Brothers or yeah. COVID or what have you. Sure. But it's going. I mean, luxury became much more dem uh, democratic. And globalized. And, and globalized. Yes. And we're still nowhere in Indonesia, in India. In a way, I would say we're even nowhere in the US. You know, wow. in the old days, 10 years ago, we were talking about the East Coast, West Coast. Now, some of the biggest states, the most important states for the luxury is, is Texas, right? Yes. You know, Absolutely. Uh, of course, we everybody's talking about Florida, Miami, etc., yes. etc. But the U.S. with the GDP they have, in terms of luxury consumptions, a uh, consumption, they are nowhere. They are nowhere. So of course we need to talk about China, and Brighton was never present in China. But five years ago we first had to buy back our agents, then we put in place a new management, then COVID came zero COVID strategy, etc. And now we are relaunching, uh, and and we're fine. Um, um, and we're successful everywhere we open in China, we are successful. We don't have a strategic problem, you know, we're very successful in Singapore, in Asia, of all in Japan. So it's not a strategic problem. Then what you have are tactical challenges to quickly build distribution, what we're currently doing in, um, in China. But at the end of the day, the luxury industry and the watch industry, the analog watch industry will grow and grow and grow. Number one, uh, you have many untapped um, countries, by the way, all the emerging countries, Vietnam, everything, all this will come. But also very big established countries in Europe, Germany is booming, France is booming, um, UK with all the Brexit is still doing extremely well, but also the US will be growing. So, uh, you know, the, the whole 
and the, the phenomenon of this democratization of luxury will, will make that the analog watch industry in the context of the global watch industry will have beautiful days in front of, of, uh, of it. George, I, I love everything you said. Uh, you know, you were talking about TV shows and you were talking about happy days. Uh, I, you know, there was a TV show called The Bionic Man, and, and Steve Austin was known yeah, as the, oh yeah. the, the Million Dollar Man. Yeah. But George, you're the Billion Dollar Man, so uh, thank you very much for being <laughs> with us, and I uh, appreciate it. <laughs> right. Thank you, Ray. Thank you very much.